OK, guys. Um, so I've got OBS installed now, and uh, was going to talk a little bit about Unraid, I guess, and what what's happening with Unraid. Um, yeah. So to recap, ran into a few issues with my rebuild system. But I got them all worked out, got Unraid on, got the array set up, and then um, managed to get my two copies of Windows, my two VMs going. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what exactly is in the VMs and stuff. Um, I'm thinking maybe a good place to start is uh, Unraid, just start in the Unraid. So this is Unraid with the array running. I can't shut the array down because in order to do that, I got to kill the VMs and then everything shuts down and actually I can't use the machine itself. I have to, you know, remote in on my phone or something like that, which because, you know, it, it, runs in a web page you can you can run it on a phone and you can edit and it works and I've I've done a few things that way uh, so anyways so Unraid's up and running um, my array basically these HGST ones these were enterprise drives that I picked up and my understanding of enterprise drives is, is they are not quiet you actually physically hear the heads on them but they do these ones are actually SAS controllers too, so there are SAS drives, and like the controllers will technically be SAS too, so they can do parallel in and out. But in the end, basically with these enterprise drives, I find them loud, so like if if noise is an issue, don't go that way. But they out like they they are faster. They they generally are. Like I I don't know about seek times in and out, but like what I can say is is when I'm moving files and I'm working in the array, it actually does make a difference with the drive. I guess they'd have longer writes like. You know, heavier duty cycles, everything else. Technically, they should last longer. They're quite a bit more money. I know enterprise drives, you can also stick a ton of them in a rack and they can handle vibration and things like that too. But I actually do see a slight, you know, performance boost over, like, especially over green drives um, and, and things like that. So basically, I've got a few enterprise drives. I got my hands on a few. Uh, one of the enterprise drives that I'm running is for the parity on the array because the parity is always being checked and recalculated and like every time you're saving to it things are recalculating and it's going to see a fair bit of you know write cycles in particular like write where like say you're saving something to this drive it has to actually still read the other four drives and then it changes on the parity every time that you're writing you know a bit or whatever so it, there's a lot of calculations involved and then this drive this parity drive seeing like in general more writes than any of the other drives like good example is we're in you know six six hundred thirty eight thousand verse you know two hundred thousand on the other drives and then again these ones have read a lot more than anything else because every time anything is saved all the drives have to be read and then that calculation has to be made and then it has to be saved to the parity so anyways just on a note of the parity is like that eight terabyte there is an enterprise drive i also have two down here that unassigned devices is aware of and these two each one of these goes out to a vm and that gives me eight terabytes for all the steam games that don't have to be fast and like i i like to load a lot of them and play different things and i've got one for each machine one of the things that i did with my vms is i did run them pretty much like the same there are like a couple differences one is, is one vm has a two terabyte uh ssd sat ssd and then the other one has two one terabyte sat ssds and i assumed that because like I'm running the, the two one terabytes in a RAID 0 to get the two terabytes, or if that makes sense. And then uh, I assume that you might get a little bit better performance out of them. But to be honest, my two terabyte is actually giving me better performance. Probably, to be honest, it's, it's newer, probably just has a better controller and everything else in it. And again, like when you're, when you're looking at flash chips, the more chips you have, the, the more you can save to the technically in certain situations, the better your bandwidth too. But realistically, it all is limited to whatever you can get on the SATA controller. But the interesting thing is, is I do actually run um, a check, and for some reason on these these controllers that I've dedicated, when I raid my two one terabyte SanDisk drives, because they're obviously not as good of a drive as the the Samsung 860, the Samsung beats it, you know, and I don't know why. 
that's just what I'm seeing. You'd assume that it would, they'd, they'd just all max out at the 150 megabyte a second, and that's where you'd be, but there's a lot more, like I don't fully understand QDAPs and like reads and everything else, but in general, the Samsung does tend to do better. So the other thing, I'm, I'm rambling because I'm just, I do that sometimes, I apologize. Uh, one of the things that, or like the main thing that I gave them too, is I each gave them a 512 gig NVMe because NVMe is lightning fast and that's what we want to put Windows on, some of the main games and things. And 512 is good. These XPG Gamix ones, they are a very impressive chip. I got them for a good deal. They're like the, the um, drives, they're very impressive. They pull well, I get good good read times and seek times on them, like they, they run great and uh, I haven't had any issues. The last drive here too that I'm kind of dedicating out to one of my machines is a 128 gig Samsung. Had it for a while, it's only 128 gigs. But I'm actually using it as a, uh, like a temp drive for when I'm downloading all of my incomplete torrents. So I just like torrent to that drive and then when something's finished then it copies it over and like we'll put it into the array or whatever, right? Back up into the array. I also have a one terabyte NVMe that I'm using in the cache of uh, Unraid as well, which I probably wouldn't have preferred to do that. But for some reason on that Intel 660P that I have, you can't dedicate it out and get the bootloader to boot off of it. There's something about like the sectors are different or it doesn't match up wherever that bootloader is supposed to be for the, like the loading program in this. I'm, I'm not sure, but it is an issue specifically like to these drives. And I don't know, there's probably a workaround, whatever else, but I just decided that I'm gonna run that as my cache, which to be honest, um, I've been moving so many files back and forth on the array that I'm not even running a cache because there's no point in copying it to the cache just to have a copy it back over to the array, especially when you're dealing in big, big data, right? So maybe once the array is set up and I'm not moving as much data and things are more stationary, I'll actually cache out on it. And then, then you have really quick transfer times to the cache and then it can take the cache to the actual spinning platters when it has time. But for now, I'm just running it there. You can see like it's only got about 45 gigs on it. And all I'm really running on it is uh, Plex. So Plex, like all of my app data is on there and then my Plex transcoding, temporary transcode files are on there as well and then dockers and at some point if I want I, I can always create like a, a virtual disk and then dedicate that out to one of the machines which dirt virtual disks avoid the network and all the network bandwidth issues <coughs> but I do find that in doing that it does take and add stress onto the cores of uh, of the CPU too where if, if you're just dedicating directly out to the VM you're avoiding having to have Unraid or the KVM manager deal with anything in any way. Like when you have your SATA controller inside, uh, like when you have your SATA controller owned by Unraid and Unraid's doing a few things with it, but then you dedicate out drives off that SATA controller, when that VM's wanting to pull hard and other things are going on, you're, you're gonna have a clash there with the controller depending on the limits of the controller. And then the other thing that you're gonna run into too is the data is actually going down the line through like the, the um, manager setup and then in, and it's in Unraid. So now Unraid's having to talk to the controller too. And I'm, I've noticed that I get a little more delay. I tend to get a some freezes and hiccups. Again, especially when I'm moving a lot of data, like installing games and things like that. Like one of the things that this system can do because it has, it actually has three uh, NICs on it, three like hardwired NICs for, um, you know, Cat5 for Ethernet. Uh, and one of them is uh, a 10 gigabit, which is excellent, uh, a Quantia 10 gigabit LAN. And I dedicate that one out to um, to the main Unraid array and like moving data and things like that. Like to be honest, my system, I don't have a 10 gigabit backbone, so there's no point anyways, but I, in theory, I will would give it 10 gigabit and it would handle the most. And then I have two one gigabit Intel NICs and I dedicate each one of those out to the VMs. But with that, I can pull pretty hard on the internet and say I've got like Steam installing on both VMs and whatever else going. Like I can I can really save to, uh, save to my NVMEs like or the in, in what I was running into in the, the SSDs that were on the SATA controller and I was like 
I think I'd even overheat this out of controller and it would slow down. Like, I don't know how they do for temperatures and stuff, but I found like running a lot of like, and I'm talking like installing games for hours because I have like a list of games and they're both just ripping and installing. I'd notice that things would, would slow down. Like one of the things I can do too on that Intel 660p is I can overheat that um, NVMe drive by saving to it. Like it, it's quick for quite a while. And then I think the temperatures actually get up because it'll actually give me a warning in Unray, which is kind of neat, saying that temps are up. And then all of a sudden, like, my performance drops to, like, a third of what I was doing. And I think that's just, like, a protection in it, too. So, you know, like, most most devices are pretty good, but, like, any long-term use like that and heavy use, then that's when we see overheating because, like, most of the time you're not hitting drives that hard. I, it's just something I've come across and doing Unray and, like, on one machine and pushing it hard I've, I've noticed that before the um, the Gamex ones that I have the NVMEs they they have a cooler on them and one thing I did too is is one of my spots gets covered by a video card that's where I ended up putting a 660p because it didn't matter where the 660p was it would overheat so I put it in the spot that's choked and like technically it's not even doing a lot with cash right now it's not seeing a lot of use anyways and then uh, uh, my other two NVMEs on the front I managed to put in an area that's not hidden behind the body of the graphics card, but actually runs through the air channel of one of them. So with, you know, with the heat sinks and stuff, I'm hoping that they do fine. I've never actually had those ones throttle out, but again, I don't save a ton of games to them. It's normally the secondaries that, um, the secondary drives that, that see a lot of games. So um, running it down, yeah, see they give you temperatures, everything else that you, you can see where the cache is at. Sometimes I get a warning because my cache gets up into the 50s, which is too high. But um, the, like not now, not with what I'm doing on but when I was running the, that Intel drive before as like a main drive for video games and I'd save to a heavy, that's when it would overheat. A um, lot I want to talk about. Okay, so I want to get into the VMs too. Uh, processors, so 16 cores with uh, 16 hyperthreading cores for a total of 32 threads. And then um, when we go into the setup, you can kind of see what the layout is of, of uh, my, my CPU dedication. So this, I have, I have three virtual machine setups, or, and I, I can go over all of them in, in more detail again, two here in a sec. But what I've got is is my first one, this was actually the last one I made, but this is technically the first one or the primary. And that would be Jasmine, my one gaming VM. So that's my one set of uh, scripts that set up my Jasmine VM. So this is, this is a, another script of the same one and it runs specific hardware and save installs and like a specific Windows Keys, so I, I just refer to the Windows install as that, and then my second one that's Arial. So, what we have is all of my cores. So, these will be the actual physical cores on the top, and then the bottom is the corresponding hyper thread. And what I've done for Arial is I've given the first six on die one. So, this is die one, and then starting here on is die two. So, in die one, I give it the first six with two cores that I have not dedicated to the Windows VM. And when Arial is running, it's capable of running also with this version of Jasmine, which takes the first six cores of the second, the second CPU um, core, like die, right? And then I've saved the last two cores again. So what I've told CPU isolation, it's exactly what it says. I'm just telling Unraid that those six cores are not able to be used because they're being used with Arial. And then these six cores are not able to be used because they're being used with Jasmine. So the only cores that Unraid is allowed to use that aren't dedicated out to VMs are these these four or two cores plus the four threads and then these two cores plus the four thread. And then with that, Unraid will use them all. But then I also have CPU pinning for my Dockers, which I'm running uh, an Arc server and a Plex media server. Really from everything I understand, that Arc server only ever needs basically like unless I've actually got a ton of players which I don't it only needs one one core like and I don't even think it has to be hyper threaded or like uh, two threads but technically I gave it two but then Plex especially when I'm dealing in like the x265 video files which I don't have a dedicated NVIDIA 
um, encoder or anything for it. I was thinking about at one time doing a video card for that, but it's about trying to find out where to put it and it was too much. So in the end, I just gave it access to like all four cores. And what it'll do is when you're playing like an X265 file, like a high-res file, it's gonna pin those cores for a bit for, I don't know, maybe 12 seconds. It, it just pins it out for a sec. And then once the buffer catches up and stuff, then, then you're okay. Uh, and while it's pinned, because I have nothing else that's really depending completely on Unraid, I haven't had an issue with being able to pin all the cores that Unraid has access to. It doesn't give me a hiccup. I haven't had any troubles yet in the VMs that way at all. But on that note, I think you might run into troubles pinning the cores like that, say if you have dedicated out hard drives or you have virtual disks that you're running, because then now there is more going on in Unraid that has to be managed as that in-between layer between your OS and the physical hardware, Unraid's doing more. When I'm dedicating out the way that I am in the hardware pass, you're literally just passing through. So there's, there's no changes, there's no looking at it, it's just directly dedicating it that way. And that's what really helps keep latencies down and keeping the performance up and getting as close to bare metal as it can is to try and not use virtual disk, try and not, like, and again, like, I had a suspicion and I ended up going for it and I got those extra SATA controllers and I dedicated out controllers instead of hard drives and took the stress off the controllers that way and just ran one controller for VM1, one controller for VM2, one controller for Unraid. It really helped with any like hiccups and stutters and things that would happen during game installs and during some gameplay sometimes too. And um, it was one of the problems that I've had. And I know some people have told me that their performance hasn't been great. I don't know totally why. Obviously, I guess it's just waiting if the controller is busy or something's happening. Like say, now we're sending a you know a file across and we're calculating parity at the same time. You're trying to pull off a drive, and now that SATA controller is doing a lot of work. You're going to have wait times where the SATA controller now for the Windows VMs is only for them. It doesn't do anything other than what Windows calls on, and that's helped I think in like load times and performance. I mean, again, like the biggest change is like NVMEs. If you can dedicate out an NVMe drive to the Windows itself, then it's really quick. The only other southern leg that I see or like hiccups or any freezing performance, again, was when I was doing large installs in Steam directly to the drives and for like, you know, just pinning out like gigabit connection and then making those VMs save. That's where sometimes I'd start to see a hiccup or like hold up. And like what would happen is, is you get like a full screen mock-up for a sec and you're like, what's going on? Lose my mouse. Well, like it's it's literally waiting. The NRQ list is waiting, and then all of a sudden everything's good again. So this was the best way I found around that. And um, I don't know. I, I think if you're like only running a, like a, if if you were to do your setup properly, I'm sure with with virtual disks and dedicating out hardware, and you're not drawing heavy on it, like it, that exact example that I'm giving, you'd probably be fine. But with what I have now, like you can really, really push the system and it doesn't seem to have that lag and delay. And this is the setup that I'm running. And then when I decide to shut down the two VMs and just run one main VM, then I dedicate out all of this as the Jasmine one of one. So only one machine can run at a time, one virtual machine. And then it gives me 12 cores, 24 threads with the exact same core still dedicated out. So it, it doesn't really change there. And then instead of 24 gigs of RAM to each VM, I'm giving this one 48 and it still leaves, you know, plenty of room for, for anything Unraid's going to do and the dockers that way. But that's got everything else set up. Um, So one of the big things with hardware pass-through, and this is what I was going to talk about with my VMs. Um, so you can see I've got two 1080 Ti's there. But one of the first things that we've got to do um, is you got to make sure that HVM and IOMMU group both say enabled here, and then that allows you to do all of the hardware pass-through that you're looking to do. But one of the big, um, let's see. Let's go system devices. So one of the things that I did end up having to do with this board is I had to run the ACS override. 
and I think there's actually two of them. I can't remember what the second one is, but I ran the full override. And that really helps break up everything that it finds into its own IOMMU group. And they have to, every device has to be in its own group in order for you to, to properly split things apart and utilize it. And I remember that all of my NICs and everything that was basically on the, um, the, the controller was like the, on the motherboard controller, all of it was grouped into one. So in running this and then rebooting the, with the override, it did split up my groups really well. And uh, there's, there's quite a few things in the group and I've made a list of all of them, but like just for instance, this one here, that's the 10 gigabit ethernet. And then I've got another ethernet controller here. I've got my wireless, which I technically can give out to you, my second one gigabit ethernet controller. And then what I've got here is my Marvel. This is the top half of my Marvel controller, my SATA controller that's on the motherboard. And then this is my first NVMe slot, that, <coughs> excuse me, that I have, and that's the one ADA to drive. And then we end up with these. This is all like these all split out, but basically what it is is this is my USB controller that I bought, like that that expensive USB controller that gives me literally four USB controllers on each, you know, one on each port. So like that's full bandwidth. And you can actually dedicate those out individually because they each show up in separate groups, which is awesome, which this is hard to find. You only find that in server stuff. It took me quite a few controllers to find it. That is definitely the controller to have. So there's uh, one of my video cards and then the audio device that's attached to the video card. Um, Oh, essential instrument. That's just split encryption controller. Okay, so there is one of my USB controllers that's on the motherboard. Here is one of the SATA controllers. Actually, I think that this one is um, the split on the motherboard too. And then I've got the audio device on the motherboard. So this is, we're going kind of down through the motherboard listing here. So there's the onboard audio for the motherboard. Then we get down here, that's my Intel 660p drive. And then I've got my second ADATA NVMe drive. And then SATA controller here. Um, VGA, that's my second video card. Audio device for the video card. And then USB controller and SATA controller. So I think that actually these two up here, where did I see it? I think that this one and the other one here, no, Marvel is the old, so there's two of these here, but there's two controllers that are in this list that are in it. And actually, when I look it up, because I made made lists, you can actually see. And I set up, so these, these controllers here, so it's actually three parts, but it only actually shows as one and you can't separate them. But that's the controller that I've dedicated out to the Unraid operating system. So this is my eight port that's on it. And then if we go down the list, so 43 and 10. So 43 and 10, those were the ones. So 43, that is one of the SATA controllers. And then I guess there was one up at 10 too. So it's quite a ways up. So here's the other one, I guess. Oh no, what was it? Bring it back. It doesn't really matter. Oh, 43. And 7 is the other one. So 7. Oh, not group. I want this. Number 7. That's why. SATA controller there. So those were the two SATA controllers. But basically, you got to take all your hardware. Kind of got sidetracked there. And I just laid it all out. And I decided what was going where. And just kind of labeled them all out. And I have the basically the, the reference numbers and everything that I need. And um, I've said it before, and I should link his thing in this video, but um, let me see if I can find it really quick here. Okay, so this guy right here in this video I don't want to have copyright issues, but he gives just an excellent SMS projects, I guess is what it's under, but he gives an excellent breakdown of what he has to go through to do hardware pass through. And in it, he gives a link to his site 
which I, I really want to push his stuff like check it out he gives excellent rundown with the video and stuff on his site but the biggest thing is is he gives an excellent script right out here in which you just fill in your numbers for all of the hardware that you want and he tells you where to place it and everything into your scripts and that makes such a difference so that's basically what I did is I just ran an add a device script that I copied every time and I just update it like and again in his video because I don't want to give um, a tutorial on anything I'm just kind of talking about what I've got going but you can just take your numbers so 12 0 0.3 right so 12 0 0 point and then just do the three there and then add that piece in and then um, yeah it works great when you get everything dedicated out right it works really well so like in my VM scripts I think we'll open up one of them here. So in it, this is basically what it's what it's adding in every time. And this is what you're gonna see, right? So with the script, you can see subsystem PCIe managed. So PCIe, and then you get your zero zeros, and then this is what it is, right? So zero zero eight. And you can actually go by this and figure out what what devices are what but basically you copy it in for every device that you want to add into your system and uh, one of the biggest ones so eight right here so this one here this is my uh, NVMe drive that I'm booting to and I actually had to go up into the top and you have to say under here under some of the setups right under this that you don't boot from a hard drive so you remove that option and then you have to just write in boot order equals one just like this and then it'll know to boot off that NVMe drive and that's where you go looking for the data um, but this is the whole script like honestly I can copy the scripts but what really is more than the scripts what's what's really important and this is where like my scripts don't really do you a lot of good is that you've got to set up all of your own stuff and then to set up exactly what you want to do figure out what's going where if like if everything splits out right but yeah, so like on my, my main Jasmine one here, when I'm running it is one. I've got 48 gigs of RAM. I still only give it the one NVMe drive. And one of the great things about Windows here, so what I do is, is when I'm writing my Jasmine script, I literally just copy the Jasmine two out of two. So I just take the whole script, like just go into Jasmine two of two here and you can edit it, just can't make changes. so this is the whole script and all I do is copy the whole thing uh, create a new VM paste it in like actually like you um, here we go okay let's do this so I don't want to stop it I just want to edit okay control A control C and then add a VM the new Windows VM highlight everything and then like you won't be able to add this because it's going to have the exact same name. So you just modify the name to, to whatever you want, like one of three. And then the other, like you'll you'll go to you'll go to create this. And it's gonna give you an error that you can't because it's the same Windows, like this self-identifying UUID, but all I do is like take that F and change it to another hexadecimal key, like one whatever it changes it just enough that now unraid's boot loader doesn't have an issue with it lets you create it and like if i wasn't running jasmine i could actually like boot boot off of it right now too but <clears throat> yeah anyways it it works and from there i add in my secondary uh 1080 ti and like all of the other stuff one of the neat things i've kind of learned about it too though is like so this this one's not on but what I can do is is it actually here's all of my hardware that's dedicated out which is really neat and then you can add in your video cards everything else but like if I want to add the other you know other SATA controller the other which I technically don't want to do I just want to add in the USB I don't need the second NIC and you just from there save it I can um, go from there but I'll also like under your graphics card you want to run the second 1080 Ti you also want it to run the same BIOS so there's no issues from what you grabbed and then you also have to make sure that your secondary sound card also gets put in and then as well I've got my onboard audio I'm gonna put it in as well so I'm running three sound cards on that main system 
and I run no primary VDIS, right? Nothing that way, just run it. Um, that's got the graphics cards in, sound cards are in, ran the extra USB controllers that I've dedicated out. And then I just set it up, bang, 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 run the same cores that I know I am not, like, I haven't dedicated out to Unrain update. And then that is literally, that would have been the one on one, but I've already created it. But that would have been exactly what I had set up. I'll create, like, give it more RAM too, I guess. But it's fairly easy to do. Um, I'm going to remove that one of three. That's not the one I really wanted to run. Okay, but that's all of them there. Uh, really, yeah, the scripts and breaking it down and just making it make sense was, was the biggie on it. And it worked really well. Like, everything runs great. 24 gigs of RAM. Computers run really well. Um, haven't had any troubles at all with it. At all.